worthy is the lamb. And I'm depending on that worthy lamb this morning. Have you ever heard of someone in the Bible with the nickname Camel Knees? Could you just raise your hand if you've heard of that person? Someone in the Bible was called Camel Knees. Okay, well, I don't see any hands, so today all of you will learn something, which is good. Okay. The scriptural focus today is from James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18. And the theme is effective prayer. I'll be using the new King James Version. And I shall read. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Let's pray. Father God, we've just read about prayer. Our focus today is prayer and your power that we can obtain through prayer. We've had conversations about this, Lord. There are things that I've had to discard. There are things that I hope I've kept in that you want me to speak about. And I pray, Lord, that whatever you have to say, that I will be a worthy vessel that you say it through. In Jesus' name, amen. This month's series is Power in Prayer. Every month in this church, we have a different focus, and that is a focus for this month, power in prayer. And I think that's a necessary topic, especially in view of what we've been hearing is going on in our locality, and we know the different things that are happening within our church. Now, as we've also heard, this week is week of prayer, or next week, or starting today, going on through next week, is the week of prayer. And the theme is, I don't see, I don't see if you were listening to the announcements. Does anyone remember what the theme was? Don't worry if you can't answer, because sometimes when we hear things the first time, we don't remember. But the theme is, be his witness. What's the theme? Excellent. You'll remember that next time. Now, today, to commence the month's series on power in prayer. The topic is effective prayer. And I'll be combining the topic that I was given with today's reading for the week of prayer. So if you have a week of prayer reading and you wish to refer to it, then please feel free to do that because there are some elements of it that you're going to be are going to be hearing mentioned in what I'm going to be speaking about. Now, when we think of effective prayer, or when I thought of effective prayer, I thought of James. The book of James is a, is, is, is a book that contains prayer as one of its major themes. When we think of the book of James, it's about practical righteousness. How we, as Christians, should be living for God in a practical way. Now, the book offers sound advice for practical Christian living, examining issues such as, and this is James, like in a nutshell, the issues that you'll see in the book of James 
I think there's five chapters in, yeah, five chapters in James, and he covers things like prayer, steadfastness in faith, talks about impartiality, demonstrating faith in God by service for God, the power of our words and proper control of our tongue, overcoming worldliness, how to live when we have problems, and finally, there's an exhortation to practice patience while we await the return of Jesus. So there's a lot packed into those five chapters. And even more so, when we're going to just look at these verses in chapter 5, verses 13 to 18, there is so much packed into those verses alone as well. I'm going to ask for James chapter 5 to be put on the screen again, please. And we're going to read it together. And just look in these 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, six verses, how many times prayer is mentioned. Okay, so ready? Have we got it up there? James chapter 5, please, on the screen. We're going to read it together. Right, is anyone among you? We're going to read it together. Is anyone? Let him? Pray. Is anyone? Cheer. Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. Earth produced its fruit. Wow, that's a lot of prayer packed into six verses. How many times? Seven. Seven. Oh, God's special number, seven. Seven times of prayer in six verses. But what is prayer? We come to church, we pray. We are at home, you might pray. I'm going to just have a little bit of involvement here and just give your definition of what you think prayer is to the person next to you, if you're comfortable with that. Off you go, please. those online you could be putting it in the chat as well what do you think prayer is okay that's quick enough or long enough I should say if there's anybody that thinks they've got a fascinating um, description of prayer I'm going to take just a few just a few anybody wants to let others know what is prayer you might say that's a question that everybody that everybody knows but come on in yes yeah Talking to your Heavenly Father. Any other? Yay. Interceding. Interceding. Okay, I'll take one more. Sister Levy. Oh, two. Okay, opening our hearts to God. And Gabrielle, did you have your hand up there? Oh, I thought, I thought you did. I didn't want to miss you out. Okay, I did say one more, and we've got the three. Opening your hearts to God. And someone's just flicked their finger up. I'm going to, I'm going to take yours quickly. Yes. Okay, a method by which you form a relationship with God. Now, I have a, an older sister who's a teacher, and at the end of her emails, she's got a little catchphrase, teaching is a work of heart. Yeah? And as Sister Levy said, it's opening up your heart to God. But I've got some other definitions here. And the first one that we heard, talking to God. I have communicating with our creator. Here's one I like. Giving our attention to God in a two-way spiritual relationship where we talk to God and also listen to him. And the final one, I think um, Elder Leslie looked in my notes, is a, a means of developing a relationship with God. Okay? So for those of you who are here or online that needed some more definitions, you may have your own. 
These may have reinforced what you've already considered prayer to be. But there are four plus three um, definitions that we've heard this morning that might help to broaden your perspective. Because let's take a teacher in a class, for instance. If the teacher in the class got up in front of the class and spoke for the one hour of the lesson, do you think the children would get much out of that? No. Right? There needs to be some kind of reciprocation. There needs to be some kind of dialogue, some kind of conversation. Okay? Um, we have spouses. Are you going to develop that relationship with your spouse if you don't speak with them? Are you going to develop that relationship with your spouse if you just speak and you don't listen? <laughs> okay? So it's the same with God. There's um, a definition here, or a a likening of prayer on a lesser level to a child having a conversation with their father. It's natural for a child to ask their father for things that they need to seek advice or guidance or to express gratitude. And it's also polite for the child to listen to what the father says in response. So it's not just about talking, talking, talking. We need to take that time to listen. Now, when we get to James chapter 5, that's not the first reference in the book of James that is made to prayer. In fact, from chapter 1, James, who was writing to the 12 tribes of Israel who were scattered among the nations, said in verse 2, count it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And when we move on to verses 5 to 7, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all who will without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Wow, powerful. Now, a Christian writer on the early church by the name of Hegesippus, he wrote that James, and do you know who James was? The, the writer of the book of James in the Bible is actually a brother of Jesus. Okay, so James the brother of Jesus wrote the book, and he was known to be one who would frequently enter the temple alone and was often found on his knees asking forgiveness for the people so that his knees became hard after the manner of a camel. On account of the fact that he was always bending down upon one knee, worshipping God and asking forgiveness for the people. So who's camel knees? James, okay? And James now, when we're looking at his work, we can see that he has personal experience of prayer and knows what he's talking about when he speaks on the subject. The question is, and don't answer this aloud, it's a rhetorical question, if someone were to assess your prayer life, would they be able to call you camel knees? Now, regarding effective prayer, in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, James clearly states that sometimes we do not have things. Why? Because we do not ask for them. Or because we're asking for certain things with the wrong motives. And thus, it renders our prayers ineffective. Now, we want to know how to deliver effective prayer. So far... Hopefully you've been able to work out that a Christian needs prayer, and lots of it. Do you agree? Yes. Good. Now, if you claim to be a Christian, but you do not pray, you're simply a church member. For a Christian, prayer is not an option. It's a biblical mandate. It tells us that in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. It's three simple words. Pray without prayer ceasing. I've heard some people marvel at how disciplined some religions are because they pray five times a day. Oh, wow. 
five times a day. I couldn't do that. Hang on a minute. If I was to count how many times I've already prayed today, it's definitely more than five. It's definitely more than five. Okay? And I don't need to be facing any particular direction or putting out any special equipment. I speak with my Lord. And I long to speak with him even more so that I can find out exactly what he's saying to me without query. So what is James actually about? Our general prayers may vary, but in verses 13 to 18, which we focused on, it seems to be about times when it's not just the standard prayer that is necessary. There are actually times in our life when we need extraordinary prayers. And we'll unpick this. Let's put it into three different categories. Number one is consistent individual prayer. The number two is the confession of sin. And number three is praying according to God's will. So let's look at consistent individual prayer. When we looked at those verses, it says, is any one among you suffering, let him pray. Is any one cheerful, let him sing psalms. Is any one sick, let him call for the elders, etc. So it's asking about you as an individual. Are you in this situation? Pray about it. Sing about it. Call. It's not necessarily um, talking about corporate prayer here. It's the individual being able to recognize that they need to take action and present their situation to God. So what's the response to suffering? Pray. What's the response to cheerfulness? Sing. I was going to say pray, some of you. Sing. But that's also interchangeable. Why can't we sing when we're suffering? Why can't we pray when we're cheerful? Sometimes people only pray when things are rough. There was a song that used to be sung in church. I haven't heard it for a long time. Um, try Jesus, and if you try everything, and everything fails, try Jesus. Hang on a minute. Why are you trying everything first? Try Jesus first. Yeah? Now, um, if we're able to see hardship as a gift that helps us to trust in God and God alone, then we can appreciate the benefit of praying during times of suffering. The question also ask, is anyone of you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anoint him with oil. Why do we need to call the elders? And what illnesses give reason for us to call the elders? Do you call and say, I've got a little bit of a cold. Could you come around and anoint me, please? Or last night I stubbed my toe. Could you come and anoint me, please? Those sound a little trivial, don't they? Yeah? Um, of course, there are things that you do pray about. Lord, heal this toe, heal this, uh, heal this cold, etc. But when we've got cases that are more serious, we've got spiritual leaders in the church that have been appointed to the church and therefore are responsible for carrying out such duties. I remember my first experience of anointing as an elder. I didn't realize how major the responsibility was during the course of the day I was at work and I was getting messages from the other elders and they were saying things like, read this. And they gave a passage to read. Remember to be praying yourselves. Please do not come to the anointing service if you know that things are not right in your life. And all those sorts of things. And I thought, wow, this is a huge responsibility because if you are not in tune with God, you're wasting your time trying to pray on the behalf of somebody else. I mean, it says, let them use anointing oil. And oil has so many different purposes. It could be used for consecration. In Leviticus chapter 8, verse 30, we had Moses who took some anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar, and he sprinkled it on Aaron, on his garments, on his sons, and the garments of the sons with him. And he consecrated Aaron, his garments, and his sons. And oil also symbolizes holiness, something or someone that is set aside for special purposes. In 2 Samuel 16, we have the anointing of David when he was chosen to be king. Oil is for restoration. Again, David, Psalm 23, thou anointest my head with oil. I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. 
Anointing oil is also connected with the presence of the Holy Spirit and was sometimes used to pray for healing. If you have a pen and paper, there's going to be a few texts that I'm going to be referring to, but not always reading. Um, so if you want to jot them down and make reference to them or view this again, then please do and look these texts up. Mark chapter 6, verse 13, they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Maybe we need to take a big dousing off anointing oil down to Fairfield Halls on November the 18th. Um, but let me point out, though, that it's not the oil that actually heals. Okay, we use the oil for anointing, and God has told us to use this anointing oil. It says, anoint them with oil, and the prayer saves them. God is the one who heals through the prayer. Now, it says we'll be healed in Jesus' name as well. Some people pray and they just tag on in Jesus' name at the end and thinking that is praying in Jesus' name. Praying in Jesus' name is knowing that his will and his purpose is going to be done. Not just saying the words, but understanding. And what's the result of this? It says the prayer of the faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be, he'll be forgiven. Now, here's another area of potential misunderstanding. If the sick person is not healed, is that a lack of faith? We're told that we need to persevere. But we're also told that we need to count it joy when we're in trials. Now, the question is, is faith knowing that God will do something or that God can do something? That's where the element of faith comes in. The prayer of faith is not about our abilities, but faith in God to accomplish his word. It's an attitude of trust, trusting in what God is going to do because we don't know what God is going to do. Also, what healing are we actually seeking? He says, I will raise them up. Sometimes we think, okay, I'm going to go and pray for this person and just going to get up out of their bed. And it has happened. We have um, situations in the Bible where... Um, People have gone and they've prayed on behalf of someone and they've, seen, and they've seen the healing immediately, but that's not always the case. And we also think of um, sickness as physical sickness often. But we do have people who are emotionally sick, socially sick, mentally sick, spiritually sick, and they also need to be healed. Sometimes where it does come to any of those forms of illness, and it may um, result in the person passing, as difficult it, as it may be for those left behind, healing can sometimes be that final sleep that someone experiences as they are confident enough in their salvation to say, Lord, take me. It says their sins will be forgiven. Sometimes that could be implied as, all right, who has sinned why this person is sick? You or your parents. But sickness is not always a direct result of someone's personal sin. Hence, James says, if sins have been committed, then that praying could help to raise them up. If. That, does this mean that the sick person experiences spiritual healing, and though they may pass on, their spiritual life is secure enough to be raised up, not immediately, but when Christ returns. So the raising up, you may see as you pray. The raising up could be talking about we'll be raised up to meet Jesus when he comes. Think about it. Sometimes, though, illnesses do occur because of our sinful behaviors. Hence the reason why James admonishes us to confess our sins. Why confess? Why confess? Again, it's for healing. James says there in, in verse 16 of chapter 5, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, how many people are here sick. How many people are killing themselves because of an inability to maybe even forgive somebody else 
They think that they're hurting the other person who might not even be thinking of this unforgiving individual, but yet they're destroying themselves physically and definitely spiritually. Jesus himself in the model prayer says that we need to forgive others if we expect to be forgiven. So what is this effective prayer? What is this fervent prayer? When I see the term effective, I get bad memories of Ofsted coming into school and they used to put down the lesson was effective. Yeah? It means the children got something out of it. It, it. it yielded some kind of result. Okay? And then we think of things like fervent. Um, I think the Greek word for fervent is something like enthermos. All right? Now, I thought of the thermos flask and the, the heat being kept in that flask and lasting a long time. The impact of your prayer of going on for this long time. It means an earnest prayer, a zealous prayer. And these impassioned prayers that show our genuine desire for God's intervention. It's not just a matter of coming up and just praying loud, saying yes, and then thinking, yes, I'm the loudest of my prayer shows a fervency. No, not necessarily so. It's the intent of the heart in which you pray. I always remember um, Pastor Holder, late Pastor Holder, who was a pastor of this church, when he became ill. And um, the choir went round to his house and we were praying. And in fact, we were ministered onto more than how we ministered onto him, I feel. But the one thing I remember him saying is that it only takes one prayer. Yeah, that fervent prayer, that effective prayer, that one prayer that Jesus needs to hear at the time and for his will to be done through that prayer. Now, the chapter goes on, verse 17. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Elijah, a man with a nature like ours. Hmm. Hang on a minute. You might say, I couldn't do what Elijah did. He says he's got a nature like ours. Consider this. Here's the man Elijah. The first introduction that we have of Elijah in the Bible is in 1 Kings chapter 17, where he just suddenly appears and says, right, there's going to be a drought in this place. He just comes on the scene and just declares this drought. For, hang on a minute. It seems a bit random. But if you understand that when someone is attuned to God's will, what he did actually makes sense. Elijah had confidence in God and what God can do. His good relationship with God meant that God could relate to him that King Ahab, a wicked king, wanted people to stop worshipping him. This theme of worship all the time. Yeah? Ahab wanted the people to stop worshipping God and to worship Baal instead. And where it becomes even more relevant is when you understand that this Baal was the god of fertility and weather, especially rainstorms. So, we have this situation here where Ahab is saying, yep, Baal is the one, worship him. And God is saying, hang on a minute, I'm the one to be worshipped here. And your god is not going to be able to do what you think your god can do. It's me that causes the rain, not Baal. So, we've got this man here praying that it doesn't rain for the foreseeable future. He, Elijah, had actually attuned himself to God's plan because God planned to stop the rain. It's not that he just came up with this idea and said, I'm going to do this. When God's thoughts and our thoughts are unified, we're going to be a powerful force to reckon with. And that's why I'm going to encourage you at this stage to continue studying your um, Bible study guides, your lesson quarterlies, because it's, the theme is God's mission, my mission. And the lessons we've been studying are talking about how we can work in coordination with God to fulfill this mission on earth. And I hope that you're doing your challenges as well in the week, because it's a real practical lessons that we're having. That was a slight aside. Now, Elijah had confidence. And sure enough, 
It didn't rain for three and a half years. Now, if you look in 1 Kings 17, it doesn't actually put a time scale on, on it when Elijah says it's not going to rain for three and a half years. But when you calculate the time that he made that um, or delivered that prophecy and the time it did rain, then the calculations work around about that sort of length of time. Now, when we move on from seven, chapter 17 of First, first Kings... First Kings, yep, 17. We move on to, verse, to chapter 18. Then we get this massive showdown at Carmel. And Elijah is there teasing these people and just knowing that his God is going to come through. Powerful, effective prayer is there. But if it was just about praying in a particular way or using a particular formula, then why did Elijah run away in chapter 19 when he was threatened by Jezebel? Couldn't he have just simply prayed? Hmm. There's a commentator called Alec Motia, and in his book called The Message of James, he expresses that Elijah went from heights of faith to depths of despair and depression. He was brave and resolute, yet he flew for his life at the whiff of danger. He was selfless in his concern for others, yet filled with self-pity. Did God really use him to deliver effective prayer? And does this sound like some of us? How about Abraham? God called him righteous. So could he be a possible witness to what we are told in James, that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much? Now, Abraham lived in the city of Ur, which was a wealthy empire that drew traders from around the then known world. And dominating this city skyline was a pyramid-like temple honoring the 65 feet or 20 meter tall God, and the God's name was Sin. Human sacrifices were known to have taken place there. The city and the temple were built not long after the Tower of Babel rebellion. And it was a center of idolatry and heathenism. Nevertheless, out of the corrupting influences of this ancient city came out one of God's most faithful witnesses, righteous Abraham. Ellen White wrote that about Abraham, idolatry invited him on every side, but in vain. Faithful among the faithless, uncorrupted by the prevailing apostasy, he steadfastly adhered to the worship of the one true God. But how could this be? His own father, Tira, was serving other gods. But one possibility of how Abraham could have been so successful could have been um, that he had an ancestor. Now, is great, 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 great grandfather was called Eber, E-B-E-R. And this Eber was a great grandson of Shem. Shem was Noah's son. And remember, Noah also found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Eber was alive for at least 100 years after Abraham's birth because he lived until the age of 464. That's longevity. Now, it's quite possible that Eber shared God's truth with his young descendant. But regardless of exactly how he learned of God, we know from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, that by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to a place which he would receive an inheritance. And he went out. Didn't know where he was going, but he just went out. Leaving what was then the wealthiest, most civilized place on earth, Abraham was willing to be a witness for God wherever he was called to go. And we can highlight some of the ways that this great patriarch was a witness. Abraham was a witness to his family. In Genesis 12, verse 5, it records that after a brief stay in Haran, where his father died, Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, who was his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran and departed to go to the land of Canaan. We're, we are told that he did something. The first thing he did when he went 
Uh, hence, in Genesis 12, verse 7, it says, when he pitched his tent near Shechem, Abraham built an altar to the Lord. This looks like a God first philosophy to me. But he moved again. Let's see if the pattern continued. The same thing did happen. He built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This is verse 8 now. He encouraged family worship. Abraham invited everyone within his encampment to the morning and the evening sacrifices. And there were a lot of people. There was no doubt about who was the priority in Abraham's life. Now, when Abraham moved to a new place, he actually left the altar behind at the old place because that was a silent witness to all who passed by. Abraham was known in the communities where he lived to be a kind, courteous, and just man and was respected by all. He didn't believe he needed to become involved in these false religions around him in order to fit in. Knowing in whom he believed then made Abraham a witness to the larger community. He was peace-loving. When fighting broke out between his and Lot's herdsmen, in Genesis 13, verse 8, he says, Please, let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. He also allowed Lot to make the first choice in where to settle, enabling him to choose the rich valley of Sidim while he remained in the more mountainous regions, despite his age. And following the capture by King Chedoloma and his allies, Abraham still did not hold any grudge against Lot's earlier ingratitude. All his affection for him was awakened, and he determined that he should be rescued, seeking, first of all, divine counsel. Now, Abraham prepared for war, and victory was swift and complete, with all prisoners and goods re recovered, and Abraham ascribed triumph to God. Right here, we see the key to an effective prayer life. When we experience victories in life, the triumphs are not ours. Sometimes we try to claim them. They're not ours. They're God's. It also showed that righteousness is not about cowardice. And that Abraham's religion made him courageous in maintaining the right and defending the oppressed. His heroic act gave him a widespread influence among the surrounding tribes. He was also an educator, and he shared his faith with his household that consisted of more than 1,000 people. And I couldn't get 1,000 in my house. Now, those who were led by his teachings to worship the one God found a home in his encampment. And here, as a school, as in a school, they received such instructions that would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. So there was a great responsibility here on Abraham. He was training family heads and so on. But even more so than that, Abraham was a witness before God and the unfallen beings. He honored God and God honored him by speaking directly with him and revealing his purposes. Nevertheless, Abraham was human, and sometimes we use humanity to excuse our errors that we make in life. And scripture records at least three times where his faith faltered. First time, Genesis 12, verses 10 to 20, was when he lied about his wife to Pharaoh. Second time, in Genesis 16, verses 1 to 4, when he took Hagar as his wife to produce an heir, and nothing was happening with his wife. And the third, in Genesis 20, when he lied to King Abimelech about Sarah being his wife as well. So these instances reveal the danger of going to where God has not called us to go, and also listening to those who maybe try to help us, but are not because they're not quite in line with what God has indicated. So, again, Ellen White, prolific writer, points out that God had called Abraham to be the father of the faithful, even though his faith was not perfect. And so that he might actually reach the highest standard, God subjected him to another test, which was the closest which man was ever called to endure, 
You'll find this in Genesis chapter 22, where God was, where um, Abraham was told to take his son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham was not comfortable with this because he had seen the offering of sacrifices as something that is done by the heathens. Nevertheless, after wrestling in prayer, the aged patriarch moved forwards in faith. Another question can be asked there. Is anyone struggling with a decision? Let him pray. And despite his humanity, Abraham didn't stop to question God and what God can do. So as the actions took place and um, Abraham was about to slay his son as instructed, God said to him, stop. I'm going to provide myself a sacrifice. Now, if we understand what that actually means to the people in, to the people, to those heavenly hosts, um, they were looking on to see what was actually going to happen here. It says, with intense earnestness, they watched each step in the fulfillment of this command, went to Isaac's question, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham made the answer, God will provide himself a lamb. And when the father's hand was stayed, he was about to slay his son and the ram was provided instead. It was then that light was shed upon the mystery of redemption. And even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. So we said earlier that God's mission is our salvation, and our mission is to share the good news of mission, God's mission, wherever we can. So we need to work in partnership with God, and this communication through prayer that we have with God is how we develop that partnership with God. And we need to also understand that when, whatever the circumstances, we can pray. We have the Apostle Paul, who we're aware that people used to bring their handkerchief just to touch Paul and take that same handkerchief home and touch the person who wasn't, wasn't well and they'd be, they'd be healed. But this same powerful Paul, despite his handkerchief experiences, in 2 Timothy 4 verse 20, we read of where he couldn't heal somebody. And in Philippians 2 27, he also mentions somebody who was critically ill. Why couldn't he just say, oh yeah, I'll pray and they'll be healed? He understood that it's in as much as God's will needs to be shown at that time is how we'll see the results of prayer. Paul, in fact, even prayed for himself. Three times he mentioned a thorn in his flesh. He had some kind of affliction that he had, and God didn't answer his prayer in that regard. But God did say to him that through his pain, and through his illness and his weakness, that he could be strong. And why did God use that thorn? Paul needed to be humbled. And when Paul realized this, you know what? He said, I think I'll keep this thorn in my flesh. Yeah, it's um, actually beneficial to me. So unfortunately, in this life, nobody has a natural immunity from suffering. We're all going to be or are being or had been recently afflicted or stressed or distressed by something. Paul actually rejoiced in his suffering because he realized that he couldn't do anything about it. Suffering is not optional, but misery is. Jesus was the healer. None was here more righteous than he. Yet, even His um, situation meant that there were times that he did not heal everyone. He had the capability, of course, but he didn't heal everyone. And he even pleaded for himself with the Father. Think about it. When he was in Gethsemane, he said, could you take this cup of death from my trembling hands? But he added the words, nevertheless, not as I will but as you will. Despite all the pain and severe temptations, the devil pressed upon him, and Jesus yielded to God's will without the murmur and hesitation. His full submission to God is a perfect example for us to follow. Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I'm not taking that phrase lightly because that term, your will be done, can sometimes be used flimsily. 
Sometimes we're not praying in a powerful, fervent enough way, and we just say, oh, um, let's just use this as a cop out. Your will be done. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen here, and so on. We've got to be more confident in, in our prayers. Um, when we pray, we will do well to understand that God does answer our prayers that are prayed in his name to the degree and to the extent that he needs to be glorified at the time. So what about us today? Can it be said that we are a valid witness to our families? Are we positive witnesses in our community? How about this one? Are we worthy witnesses to God and the unfallen beings? If we're not, we can be assured and encouraged with the exciting awareness that God is able to do great things through imperfect people like you and me, just as he did through Abraham and Elijah. Now, when we consider Elijah, Elijah didn't see death. And Abraham, his life of faith, obedience, and service provides an important example of our witness today. The silent influence of his daily life, his unswerving integrity, generosity, courtesy, and beautiful character revealed to all that he was connected with heaven, as we also ought to be. He was able to look beyond what is seen, and he grasped those eternal realities. That's why in Romans 4 verse 3, we're able to read that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Can it be said that you believe God? That could be accounted to you for righteousness? I'd like to think for a moment. Would I actually like to be considered as righteous? Someone who is just? Someone who does what is right? We have the week of prayer coming up. It's not just only in week of prayer that we focus on prayer. Just like we have 10 days of prayer at the beginning of the year because the upper room apostles were there for 10 days. There's no secret in 10 days. There's no secret in week of prayer. Our lives need to be a consistent prayer with God. If we lose that connection, our lifeblood is gone. I'm going to ask you a question. If you would like to be considered righteous and are willing to commit to a more consistent prayer life so that your will becomes perfectly aligned with God's will. I'm going to invite you to stand with me so that we can say a prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are here talking to you once again because you've given us the opportunity to do so. I pray, Lord, that our will will be perfectly aligned to your will, that we will be doing things in our lives that will help us to reinforce that mission that you have set for us to do, to go out, teach all nations, and let them know who you are, what you can do, because this earth isn't where we want to be. Our life ought to be with you. So I'm praying for everybody standing now and those who are still considering their decision on having a more fervent, effective prayer life in you, that you will seal this decision, that you will enable them to go away and think about what they have just stood up for and be willing to speak with you without ceasing. In Jesus' name, amen.